Thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. We are so excited to have you. My name is Erica Houston and I am the gallery director here at Peters Valley School of Craft. Um, and we are so excited to have Liz Hamilton Quay with us today for her artist lecture. If you're not familiar with Peters Valley, it's a nonprofit organization with a, a mission to enrich lives through the learning, practice, and appreciation of fine craft. We are located in northern New Jersey in the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. We host adult workshops in May through October of each year. We also have the Peters Valley Gallery, where we feature over 250 fine craft artists in the retail space. And then we have the Exhibition Gallery that showcases several exhibitions each year, like the one that we are here to talk about with Liz. Before I hand things over to Liz, I just want to highlight a few things about the structure of this evening's lecture. Since we are in Zoom webinar format, there's no sound or video for participants. However, we do have the Q&A and we have the chat feature. I will be monitoring these throughout the lecture and Liz is also able to see them. So if you have any questions during the lecture, please feel free to add them to the Q&A chat so we can address them throughout the evening. The lecture is gonna be about 45 minutes and then we'll leave some room at the end if there's any additional follow-up questions that y'all may have. With that, I would like to introduce Liz Hamilton Quay, who is presently serving as the Assistant Professor of Textiles and Material Studies at Kutztown University of Pennsylvania. She has seamlessly woven her passion for fabric manipulation into a distinguished career. Her artistic journey began at Kutztown University, where she earned a bachelor's degree in art education and a BFA in craft with a concentration in fibers. Further advancing her expertise, Liz pursued her MFA at Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, specializing in fibers and material studies. Her work is currently on display in the Peters Valley Gallery in her show titled Delicate Resilience through April 5th. If you've not yet seen the pieces in person, I highly encourage you to come see us in the next couple of days as there is such a wonderful materiality to each piece that is so hard to capture in an image. That said, we do have a virtual exhibition available on our website, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat to that for anybody who's interested in just a little bit. But without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Liz. Great. Hey, thank you, Erica, for such a warm welcome. And I just want to say hello to everyone out there. And thank you for joining us on what in Pennsylvania is very rainy evening. I am going to share my screen. All right. Okay, as mentioned, um, I'm Liz Hamilton Quay, so welcome. Um, I, I consider myself a soft sculpture artist and a material studies artist. Uh, this is my solo exhibition, uh, Delicate Resilience, which has been a work in progress for over seven years now. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, to kind of get started, um, I have some overviews of uh, the gallery space, a really beautiful Peters Valley gallery space. Um, I would say my work lives in duality. It's hard versus soft, joy versus fear, pain versus pleasure, fulfillment versus loss. All of my work is tinged with those mixed emotions. Um, and you know, while I'm making it and while you're viewing it, I was hoping, you know, hoping that the viewers see that and feel that too. After the arrival of my daughter and subsequently becoming a mom. It dramatically enhanced and expanded my concept of how the body manifests emotional balance. So motherhood is delightful and hard, but it's also beautiful and messy. So here's some more overviews of the gallery space. There are just two pieces off to the left-hand side, unfortunately, um, that aren't captured in this image, but I'll be sure to share them with you tonight. Okay. I use materials that are inherently uh, delicate and strengthened in a variety of ways through my processes. Um, and I find that similar to the strength that I find, uh, you know, coming that I receive from my family. I always aim to create an alluring outcome from the struggle of finding that balance. Um, so I'd like to take you on a journey through my work, uh, how it was created and how it connects to my experience as a mother. So going to this first piece, this is uh, this really long piece over on the um, right-hand side. Okay, so here are some detailed images of it. A new is one of the oldest pieces in the exhibition, and it was actually created before I had children. 
Um, but it's been included in the exhibition because it represents a delicate balance of choices and decisions and really their unknown impact. Um, really everything that comes with being a parent, honestly. Um, the entire piece is about 15 feet long and it's made out of uh, white vinyl. And if you get close to it, it has like a, a skin-like texture to it. Um, and then piercing the surface are uh, dressmaking pins for the full span of 15 feet. Um, the pins are at eye level, which really confronts the viewer um, and it creates almost like a sense of danger within the piece. Um, but beneath it uh, created are these overlapping um, and really delicate shadows underneath, um, you know, which to me suggest like a beauty in the unknown. Um, again, my entire experience as a parent so far with this piece. Um, yeah. Moving along, um, uh, the next piece is embalmed tubes. Do you have a beautiful video? Uh, for me, this piece really, it, it, this happened, you know, when I was thinking I'd been with my partner, with my husband for, you know, about eight years at this point. And, you know, we hadn't really thought about children, but, you know, it was getting closer to 30. Um, and I, I was, you know, that question comes up. Um, so this, this piece grew out of a set of questions that I had for myself. Uh, for my pre-pregnant body. Um, it was aging, it was medicated, you know, was it even going to be able to sustain a pregnancy? Um, you know, all of the intricacies of the body that need to work in harmony is really anxiety inducing. Um, so I was thinking about the state of preservation that I needed to maintain in order to have a healthy pregnancy. And honestly, um, you know, to know if my body will even work properly when I need it the most. But I wanna talk about the materiality of this piece. Um, all of my materials and all of my work, um, as El uh, Ricky so eloquently put it, um, you know, the material is really important to my overall concepts. Um, it's not like paint. Um, it's, you know, all of these materials inherently have some kind of concept or meaning or history behind them. Um, not that paint doesn't, I'm sorry, um, but uh, my mom's a painter, so I really appreciate the art of painting, something that I cannot do well. Um, but all of my material choices are really significant conceptually. I work with materials such as sheer organza, leather, felt, gut, and vinyl. Um, all of these materials are connected to the body in some way, either as a mechanism to envelop the body or actually derived from, you know, a uh, a body, not the human body, uh, an animal body, or a simulation of the body. Um, so this is a an in-process shot uh, for the next piece, Embalmed Rupture, but it was created very similarly, similarly to Embalmed Tubes. Okay. So in both, both pieces, Embalmed Tubes and Embalmed Rupture are made from organza coated in shellac. So if you're unfamiliar, uh, organza is a really thin, a uh, delicate, uh, virtually see-through transparent material um, that you would find maybe on like formal wear or something like that. Um, uh, traditionally, it would be derived from silk. I'm working with um, a polyester version in most instances. Okay. Um, so I use organza a lot in my work. I feel like it um, it's light and seemingly so fragile but I can change the properties uh, when I uh, add different surface textures to it. So I kind of liken that to being a mother. There are moments of absolute fragility and I'm bolstered by the love and comfort of my children and my family. So in this particular process, the organza is being coated in shellac. Um, so it changes the properties to be actually become more fragile than the um, original organza would be. Um, the organza is no longer transparent. It has this uh, like texture to the surface where it kind of is, the shellac is puddled on the surface of it and around it. Um, it turns into like a paper like texture, uh, which really it tears very easily. So again, that was really important to the concept of the piece so that it's, um, you know, it is a really stable fabric until you start like stretching it and pulling on it. And it's like, oh, the elasticity is no longer there, right? 
Um, again, the duality is important to my over overall concept of the conflicted space of motherhood. Oops, sorry. Um, but in particular, uh, this piece speaks to the readiness and excitement, but also the repeated disappointment uh, when trying to conceive. Um, each time that cycle repeats, it leaves behind a really well-preserved emotional mark. Um, yeah, I really, I struggled um, with my second pregnancy. Um, I had very limited amount of time to be able to, um, you know, conceive um, because I was, A, I was getting older, but B, I wanted to make sure that Nicholas, my two-year-old, now two-year-old, um, was born in the summer months, and that can be really challenging when planning a pregnancy. Liz, we have a question, and I was kind of wondering, too, when you were talking about how um, fragile the organza gets after you shellac it. Um, Jacqueline's wondering as well if you have to mold that organza into the shape before you shellac it or like because they're sewn tubes, right? Yes, they're sewn tubes. So, um, okay, so uh, it stays flat. So these are um, kind of the like offshoots um, of of the tubes, the smaller ones here, not quite like the large ones. Mm -hmm. um, but I, so I drench them in the shellac and then I let them completely dry on the tarp. So uh, the shellac releases from that plastic really easily, but it leaves all those beautiful like wrinkles behind in it. Um, and it's stable enough to be able to sew it together. So I take those pieces and just kind of, um, you know, wrap them into a tube. So it's not a traditional, what you would consider like a tube shape. They're kind of more of these like elongated triangular or diamond shape pieces. So you can see, like, I was really interested in like that irregularity that's happening within it. Um, and particularly the, these little tendrils that kind of felt like they were dried up and um, kind mm -hmm. of shrinking away from themselves. Yeah. Did I answer the question? I think so. Yeah. I think I was... <laughs> curious about the fragility too like if the sewing machine even just sewing that line if that would like rip the fabric but it's it's still so, kind of sturdy because even when we yeah. moved the piece around in the space during installation and things like that it's not like it was gonna crumble on us oh no 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 it's not gonna crumble so what will happen so if you use this when I use the sewing machine on it it creates like a perforation to the fabric so if I try to you know um seam rip anything that tube is kind of gone or I have to trim okay. it back in yes. a way so in that regard um it's it's really delicate but it does it has strength um in like the structure yeah. of being sewn for sure right very cool thank, thank you, you. Mm -hmm. so I was looking at the Q&A and not at the webinar chat so I've got the webinar chat up now I have <laughs> so. them both up so if, <laughs> if anything comes through I'll be sure to to bring thank it up too Okay, so we're kind of somewhat switching gears a bit for the next several pieces. Um, the pieces that, well, you saw one white piece, but you've seen, um, you know, the more colorful things. Um, I would say my palette is either, um, you know, pinks, browns, and yellows, which is extraordinarily bodily, right? Or it resides in the black and white, um, which is, to me, it just represents like the simplified way to view the world. Um, so my work either like bounces between those two palettes typically. So we're going to be looking at the these next three pieces. Okay. Um, also to get a sense of scale as well. Um, it doesn't, in the photographs, you can't really tell that uh, the piece on the right is almost six feet in height as compared to this piece, which is, you know, closer to three feet. Okay. So for me, it's been an incredible experience to watch uh, my children grow and become ever more curious by the day. Um, uh, this piece, a smaller piece enveloped, um, finds the childlike joy in this development. So it's really like an homage to, you know, the curiosity that my children have, you know, in their own personalities come to fruition. Um, it's layered in scales, um, which are made out of um, industrial felt. Um, and the scale, the scaling is so important to me. A, it's a texture and a pattern that I really enjoy creating, um, repetition, um, in shape as you, um, you know, we'll soon find out is really important to my work. 
but it also to me suggests growth, um, but also um, kind of like an armor around it. Um, so it's kind of like a protection based implement as well. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other, the next piece next to it is encroaching. Um, so it, to me, it's its tandem piece. Um, it's meant to be the mothering figure that goes along with the childlike curiosity of the other piece. Um, it is really domineering in height. Like I mentioned, it's all, it's over, it's close to six feet. It's not over six feet, close to six feet. Um, but it is really gentle when you're, you know, beside it. Liz, uh, this, yes. You kind of have that picture in the background, which kind of shows the height compared to your standard oh, yes. wall. So if anybody's kind of curious, you can peek at that. Absolutely. Um, I would say this piece in particular conceptually wrestles with um, just being a parent and the balance of that. Uh, my notes just disappeared. Oh, no. I was afraid of that. Here we go. Okay. Sorry. Um, conceptually, uh, you know, the, like to me, it really wrestles with the idea of parenting um, and balance. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about the challenges of maintaining my own expectations and wants for my children while also, you know, giving them the freedom to be themselves. So here are some creation shots of encroaching. Uh, it's really satisfying for me. Anything that like includes like a rhythmic stitch um, has got my interest for sure. Uh, this, uh, the, both of these two pieces are, uh, have a chicken wire armature. Um, they're made, like I mentioned before, of industrial felt, um, which is meant to be really comfortable and approaching. Um, each scale uh, for both pieces are hand cut um, and layered. I can't even, there's hundreds of pieces of felt on here. Um, so they're individually stitched onto the armature. And then this gray cascade, the ombre between the black and the white, um, that's white pieces of felt that are covered with a smoky gray vinyl um, to be able to make that transition um, up. And, you know, that transition happens in quite a bit of my work. So this is also the first instance um, of my use of iridescence in my work. You know, as a, as a little kid, I was uh, kind of, I would say almost, I was almost raised like genderless. Um, so when, you know, I'm, I, was more towards the tomboy. I kind of rejected anything that was like super feminine and kind of pushed away from that. Um, but now I kind of embrace my inner Lisa Frank and I'm really excited about pinks and iridescence. And um, conceptually, I think it really fits in um, with my work as well because it iridescence is the shifting of light, right? So it's ever changing. Um, and I feel like this is a perfect representation of my experience as motherhood. It's both elastic and fleeting um, and something that you're like constantly chasing and can't really wrap your, you know, your senses around completely. Um, when I work with something that's iridescent, because I think it's, uh, you know, because of the fragility of it, um, I try to pair it with something that creates a lot of tension. So in this case, um, with, um, enveloped here, the smaller piece, the childlike piece. Um, I've incorporated the pieces of um, iridescent over the felt, but they're only tacked in, they're not stitched in, they're only tacked in with the dressmaking pins, which are really precarious. Um, so it's just like this adornment, but in a really, um, you know, almost dangerous sense. So I have another close up here. Um, of how it scales over the neck of the piece. And actually, if you look inside, it's it's hard to, you can't tell in the photo, but if you look inside this piece, there's like fringy black iridescence as well. So during, <laughs> during the pandemic, um, yeah, I found it extremely difficult to make work, as I'm sure a lot of people did. I was teaching full time. I had to transition all of my studio classes 
online and be able to figure out how to turn my studio into a classroom slash video studio, a recording studio. Um, so it didn't leave a lot of extra space for me to be able to work. So I started working on this really, this small collection of things. Um, and this is the extension of self collection. For me, they really sum up how I felt as a mother during the isolation of the pandemic. Everything was so overwhelming at that point, right? I was a full-time mom. I was a full-time teacher. I was a full-time videographer and editor. Um, and, you know, I had to squeeze in being an artist all around this, right? So I was creating these small, tedious, repetitive works that allowed for my continuous control when I felt like everything was really spinning out of control in the world. Um, so they're kind of a, you know, a motif that's being replicated from the last pieces. Um, but I was using, I got really into different methods of making for these two. Um, instead of using that really heavy industrial chicken wire or metal lath that I've used in my previous pieces, which are, you know, made or made for larger sculptures, I was trying to find something that would work in a small scale. So I was able to find this really beautiful heat transforming or heat um, moldable, malleable plastic gridding. Um, so you can dip it in water and kind of shape it or you can use a heat gun um, and create these beautiful shapes. So I got really into that for a long time. Um, so I have quite a few of these. Um, but then instead of cutting the industrial felt by hand, which is you know extraordinarily tedious, um, I was I started using my Cricut so I could make one design and kind of put my pieces of felt in, and they would create these miniature itty bitty. Um, you know, diamonds or um, ovals or teardrop shapes, anything that I really wanted. Um, so you can kind of see a variety of those shapes in these pieces here. And I was able to cut out my iridescent fabric with that as well. So, you know, and it was portable too. It could be done from my living room while I'm still watching my kids while they're, you know, trying to go to school and whatnot. So going, you know, continuing on with the last couple of pieces of the um, black and white series, uh, Fruitful was created when I was about five months into my first pregnancy um, with Ellie. Um, this piece is made from handmade wet felt um, instead of the industrial felt. Um, the difference being the industrial felt comes on a bolt of fabric. Um, handmade felt can be shaped and manipulated any way that you want. Um, so I was able to get this really beautiful like curve to, you know, the outside of a form. Um, it has like a nice texture, thick texture to it. Um, and I was really able to just like give it this like gracefulness. Um, this to me represents that, you know, a, a slowly growing, slowly growing belly at five months, you learn it's like you're 20 weeks in to the pregnancy. You're just learning the sex of the baby. Um, you're starting to notice these like changes that are happening, um, you know, sometimes gradually, but sometimes really overnight. And to me that like the punctuation of those really strong black lines with the needle felting tool um, are really jarring, of course, are stretch marks. But again, those things that kind of appear overnight, um, I wanted to really stress that in this while still being really beautiful. Um, in all of my work, well, not all of my work, but quite a bit of my work, I really uh, appreciate the idea of like the push and pull by leaving it up to the viewer to decide if a piece is extracting or expelling something. I think Renewed does this really well, this really long, tall piece here. Um, this is the first piece where I was hand dyeing the monofilament with uh, dispersed dyes um, to create the ombre from that translucent shine up at the top of the monofilament down to this really deep black coarse. So it turns into this like almost beautiful, I don't know, it looks like it's pouring out of the form um, and then it like really gets um, almost tangled and twisted and uh, really like almost like horsehair at the bottom of it. Um, so I was really enthralled by the, this idea that I could dye my own monofilament and create this like ombre effect with it. Um, but again, it's like, is it extracting or is it expelling? Um, and then all of that monofilament is hand tied into the body of this piece through the center here. Okay. So this is my former studio space. 
Um, it has lots of little pieces of many of the works that you see here in my studio. Here you can see lots of little bits of everything that I had been working on, um, you know, throughout the show. And, uh, and I kind of want to talk about my material process. I knew this would happen. I knew my computer was going to do a backup as soon as I started this. So there are lots of little pieces um, from many of the works that are pinned to the wall and in the vicinity of this. So my philosophy is the more you live with them, the more ideas you can generate from it, right? So uh, when I'm in the planning period, I have several different approaches um, uh, to how to like to begin work. Uh, a lot of the time it is just, it's based on, it's material based. So I like live in this world of play with the material and experimentation. And I would get really into the idea of like, what's going to happen if I put this with this, or, um, you know, this piece of leather has this, uh, you know, gut stitched into it that, um, you know, has some drawing on it, or like, what does that look like with the hand embroidery next to it, or this digital print that has like free motion embroidery, um, you know, so I like looking at this like cacophony of like stuff together, and I feel like it really helps me organize what's going to come next from everything. But I really I, I create all of these samples and I embrace that idea of play. Um, you know, then I have like a library of textures and materials that I can use to create new works from. Uh, so most of these pieces are born out of that material process. And I really, I, I do like to use the word born, not just create it. I feel like every single time I finish something, it's like, whew, at the end. Um, so many of the, like, again, many of this works were created in this way, um, kind of in this free form nature, but really spurred by the love of just making. So moving back into color um, and away from that black and white, uh, hollow is actually made of um, actual gut, um, which, <laughs> you know, I experimented with this process a lot in graduate school. Uh, essentially what it is, is, you know, for this technique, you're, you use sausage casings that you get from your local butcher, um, and you use the sausage casings like paper mache. So you open them up and you kind of layer them um, around something or um, what I was doing in graduate school is making like really large pieces of, you know, what would essentially be like really thin tissue papery like parchment. Um, for this piece, I wrapped it around, um, I think a deflatable like felting ball. Um, and then I, I layered it up quite, I think there are like three or four layers. So it's actually quite thick, but it gives this really interesting kind of shiny um, veiny like texture on the surface that I, I like, I haven't been able to replicate any other way other than this technique. Um, yes, it does really smell <laughs> while you're working on it. Um, but it, it creates this really like, if you, when lights put through it, it's really luminous and just has like a really distinctive glow that nothing else has. Um, but this to me, like really emphasized like the importance of, you know, the mothering body, but also I want like sharing my feelings of divorce from my postnatal body in particular. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces of the show. I think it might be one of my favorite pieces of all time. Uh, <laughs> ovum refers to, you know, the joy of conception, but also that pain of loss. Uh, this piece represents the process of the fertilized egg in its really earliest stages of pregnancy. So that like blastocyte, right? That's like gaining and manipulating cells and dividing. So as that egg splits and multiplies, it creates a really beautiful cluster of cells, right? But it's also covered in cilia. So like that hair-like texture. I find myself when I'm doing a lot of my research for this particular work, I'm always looking at anatomical drawings or, you know, um, electron microscope. Um, those beautiful, they're just so beautiful. I could look at them all day long, honestly. Um, so I built up layer color, I mean, layers color by color with stitch marking um, into the organza. Um, to create strength from it. And it kind of like um, loses its 
transparency in a way, but it also, you know, gives it strength where it'll sit upright on its own. Um, so that stitching to me is like the replication of that cleaving process uh, that builds density on that organza. So here are some in-process images. This is kind of what the front looks like before I cut it out and um, place it on the back here. But for me, the process of layering stitches becomes a really monotonous but meditative process that I really look forward to um, in my own life and in my practice. Um, so for me, and I think for most women, um, in the early months of pregnancy, there's so much anxiety over every little thing, especially for someone who's had a miscarriage before. Um, and, you know, the early stages of uh, my pregnancy with with Ellie was really challenging. Um, I was RH or had like an RH negative. So I was, you know, had a lot of complications. Um, and I, you know, I, I frequently thought I was going to lose her. Um, so it was really scary. But, you know, using that anxiety, um, I think the layers of stitching contain it in a way um, to create this really beautiful output. So this surface design on here, again, is like built up layer by layer with color and texture. And then the back, you can see the like little hints of the front here. The back is just the organza and then um, the stitch marks of the cilia on the back. And then you can see the inside. It's not filled all the way. So it kind of has this like floppy kind of feel to it. Um, it just has poly pellets that kind of help it sit upright completely. Um, so in a similar vein, uh, the sister pieces to ovum are, and these are much newer, um, are non-viable and collapsed. Um, again, they also reference the early stages of pregnancy, but to me, they have more, you know, sor like sorrowful connotation, um, particularly around the idea of like miscarriages. Um, so to me, this, the other one, while it stands upright and, you know, more proud, more resilient, um, this piece kind of like folds in on itself. Um, it's a little bit clumsier um, and it just doesn't have the resilience that the other piece has. Uh, here are some in-process photos of non-viable. Um, so you can see, again, the you see the organza on the outside of this piece. It's completely transparent. Um, and then the stitch marks that are built up on the surface. I would say for each of those, I probably stitched them for close to 30 hours each. Um, and that doesn't include the... the... <laughs> are you laughing? <laughs> Is that so much time? Five. Yes. It, it really does. So, yeah. you know, it's like, it's, you have to build up those layers. And then if you put something that's too dark on top of it, you know, I just like, in, I intuitively work with the color, but you know, you'll put a darker color down and you're like, Ooh, okay. That's not working. So you've got to build up on top of it. And through all of that, it's really interesting that you can still see with all of that layer to stitching, it looks really solid and opaque over here. But if you look through it, there's still like transparency that's happening. I mean, that's really, that's really important for me. Absolutely. And I think I'm going to go back to something oh, I sure. said at the beginning. If if you guys haven't been able to see these pieces in person, this series is one of those that I think is just so much more vibrant in person, being able to see that transparency that she's talking about, the light from the windows behind them shining through is just really beautiful. Um, and it just adds so much more life, life to the pieces for sure. Thank you, Erica. Oh, um, Jackie had a question um, about the, the piece of um, in hollow. Um, is that natural color of the material or did I choose to dye it with the gel medium? No, that is the natural color, um, of the, uh, of the gut. Once it dries, um, the gel medium was put onto the surface as kind of like a protectant layer, um, and to give it a little bit of a sheen. Um, otherwise it's, it, it, it's really matte in finish. Great question. Thank you. Okay. And then finally, um, the last of the sister pieces is collapsed. Um, I find this to be, this one's a little hard to talk about for me personally, um, but I, I think it still has this beautiful quality, even though it's kind of in this really deflated stage. It doesn't have cilia, it doesn't have life, it doesn't have growth anymore to it. Um, the biggest difference of this piece is that it's actually, it's not using, um, 
the organza, I'm actually using satin in this piece, um, and I wanted it to be more opaque in quality for that reason. Um, and then this is a really up close version of just like the very first layer of stitching that I would do. Another image of that. Okay, um, moving along and this piece, the soul of labor uses a really similar method of stitching. As you can see, um, you can see the stitch marks kind of running through it. They're not quite as layered, um, but there's like a rhythmic pattern that works its way around kind of like a tree ring um, with this piece. Um, but I really wanted to acknowledge the actual labor and delivery process that, you know, that happens when, you know, eventually the baby has to come out some way, right? And people don't focus on that um, a whole lot. I think it's one of those topics that gets really hushed hushed. You're at like a family gathering and all the women will tell their birthing stories, um, but it's not something that we as women talk about frequently. Um, so I I had both I had very uh, difficult um, experiences with both my labors um, and deliveries, um, but I had these beautiful moments of like softness and quiet during the delivery, um, it, which was a very long and uncomfortable process, but I had true like flashes of true clarity throughout it. Even with the chaos surrounding me, I felt like moments of deep connection and calm despite being absolutely terrified. Um, and I just, I you know, I wanted that to come across in this piece. Um, there's a video of it, but it, it's really important that the piece is suspended at hip height. Um, you know, to emulate that position of a, you know, a woman in delivery, um, but it's deflated. It's just the hip portion. Um, but to me, it like it, in the center, you can't really see it. I'm sorry. Um, there's like an iridescent quality that's in the middle. And it's kind of like this, like hope that comes throughout the entire thing. Okay. Um, so I have uh, two leather pieces in the show. Um, this is the first one, um, uh, Tingle. Uh, so when I'm making dimensional forms, I, I, I like to play and be a very extreme, a very experimental. I don't typically have a pattern. I like to just, you know, put fabrics. I'll, I use a lot of muslin. I put a lot of fabric together and see how it like fits and shapes together. So when I was, uh, when I created this piece, it's just two pieces of leather. So it's kind of like a baseball kind of shaped like a baseball is created so kind of like that eight kind of shape and they're like they fit together um in harmony like this um but I kind of expanded it and widened it widened it a bit um so that it really created this deflated flat shape and when I was you know when I was working on it I'm like oh this feels like you know a deflated pelvis so it kind of sat for a while and then I'm like I really, I was getting to <laughs> my postnatal body. I was really feeling that. Um, and that's where the porcupine quills kind of came in. Um, you know, that focusing on the relationship of my body, uh, you know, after becoming a mother, uh, the porcupine quills, um, you know, while being very compelling in their line work, um, added this real sense of danger um, to the entire thing. And, you know, to this, to this body, um, and then, but it's also punctuated around the, the outside with this really thin layer of um, organza iridescent, right? So it's kind of like, there is still this, well, I don't want to be cliche, but like, like that silver lining still, like there's still hope. It's not always going to be this way. Um, moving on, this, the second leather piece is colostrum. <sighs> So colostrum, if you're unfamiliar, is the first milk produced by a mother when the baby is born. It's rich, it's fatty, it's full of nutrients and antibodies. And it's really, it's honestly the most beautiful golden color. Um, so moments after delivering a baby, the woman's expected to bond with the baby skin to skin immediately and start breastfeeding. <laughs> so, um, you know, which is really jarring. You've just had this whole experience and then you're like, you know, in that moment, very responsible for their nutritional health immediately. It's, it's, it's incredible to me. Um, so like the, I think about when I was thinking back, like the wetness of the delivery fluids on that tender new skin against my skin um, was really palpable. It's kind of like um, rooted. It's a memory that's rooted in my primal 
um, being forever. Um, I used uh, goat leather, which is extremely soft. So I used the suede side to kind of like emulate the softness of that baby skin um, for this piece. Um, but the, the first drops of that colostrum are so precious, but it is extremely, like I said, it's really stressful in that moment. You're, um, you know, you have to, you know, provide milk and sometimes women don't have, their milk doesn't come in right away. So adding to that anxiety of it. Um, I have a beautiful video here too. Okay. Um, this piece is obviously breast-like in shape, but it really references mammary glands. If you've ever seen a medical illustration of them, they're the beautiful like elongated teardrop shapes that kind of come up and like twist at the surface. And I really wanted to emulate that in this leather construction with this piece and get that like that twist at the surface. It was really important to me. Um, additionally, uh, wet on the inside, the canvas substrate in the center of the breast is really important because it adds that golden color to, you know, to the colostrum overall. And then the shiniest of the sequins um, and then the beads on the outside kind of emulate those like first drops that are so precious. Um, but to me, this quietly signals the beauty and pain of that, you know, that breastfeeding journey. Um, another vinyl piece. Vitality also touches on breastfeeding and the emotional toll of like kind of having an infant for the first time. Um, so I learned a lot with this piece. I was using vinyl in like a really different way. Um, I was sandwiching vinyl with fabric in between two layers and, you know, sending it through the sewing machine, which is, it gets really rigid really quickly. Um, but the vinyl is important for the structure, of course. That's the way it's, you know, able to stand upright. But it also creates this, like, anesthetized, smooth barrier in between the intense textures of those fabrics um, so that there's, like, kind of the separation between the two. Um, but then it meets up with this really soft palette at the bottom of that organza. It's, like, slightly padded under it. And then this, like, beautiful scattering of beads. But also it goes back to that, is it feeding or is it taking? What's it, what is it doing? Is it giving, is it pulling? Um, or, um, you know, I, I really like my audience to be questioning that. Okay. Um, and then some of the newest pieces in the show, this is a studio shot of them in construction here. And they're, um, they're the most womb-like of all of the pieces in the show. So for me, connected, uh, those are the smaller pieces down here in the front, okay? uh, you know, illustrates the forever link between mother and child, but it's also the literal connection of like the placenta and the umbilical cord, right? Um, so you can see that the pink, the ombre of this is really on the larger figure, again, that like you know, the push and the pull of the color is important to me. Hand dyeing that, um, the monofilament is important conceptually. Um, and then this piece also utilizes, it's really hard to tell in the photos, but the sandwiching of the vinyl, um, after working with it for quite a bit, you know, I picked up a few tricks, um, like using thinner vinyl. And then, you know, when you sandwich it together, um, it doesn't have a lot of structure, but if you stitch into it and create those seam lines, um, you know, in that kind of like pod-like, vein-like structuring, it gives it a lot of form and a lot of volume really quickly. So more in-process shots. This is the dispersed dye I was using to dye the monofilament. Um, and then all of those pieces were hand knotted and um, threaded into another piece of vinyl that was sandwiched and then like placed in the back of each piece um, because you couldn't stitch directly into those, um, you know, final finished forms. Okay, and then lastly, um, this is the newest piece, uh, Expectant, and it hangs slightly above the floor with the front of the piece tipping forward to kind of create imbalance. So inside this pod-like piece, there's a mass of iridescent cellophane, um, which hangs towards the back. Um, I was really hoping to capture the joy and relief that comes with like finding out you're pregnant. Um, 
you can't, it's really hard to tell in this photo, but like towards this back corner here, it's this like exuberance of this iridescent cellophane that's kind of going everywhere. It's really playful, but it also has this chaos factor to it. Um, and I wanted that to be, you know, kind of really well concealed within these layers of, it doesn't look like it in the photo, but um, really iridescent, shiny surface of the overall piece. So, I wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, a huge thank you to the Peters Valley School of Craft and its amazing staff. Here is my information. Um, everything is just Liz Hamilton Quay, either .com, Instagram, or Gmail. So please feel free to get in touch with me. But I would love to take any and all questions anybody has right now. I just shared um, Liz's website and her uh, Instagram handle and things like that in the chat as well, if anybody wants to follow there. Um, thank you so much, Liz, for sharing. We did just get um, a message from Eric in the Q&A. Uh, he says he's thinking about rep repetition that a caregiver goes through day after day caring for a child or another loved one can you talk about your relationship with repetition um is it compulsive is it healing is it something else so, yes so absolutely there's so much repetition that goes into caring for a child day in day out i think particularly with an infant um you know all of that's so riddled with anxiety, you know, you like have to keep something alive constantly. So it's this repetition of, you know, doing the same things constantly, like two hours every, you know, every two hours you're feeding the baby, you know, you're changing the baby and it, it just doesn't like end. It doesn't seemingly doesn't end. Right. Um, but so in that way, I guess the structure in my work is really complex but it's also um, really, it's like, it creates the calm for me. It creates the quiet that I'm really, I'm, I'm, I like to have a more quiet environment, um, you know, and kids bring the chaos constantly. And while I love that, I also love to be able to, you know, hear them in the background. And while I'm working, even if they're being really loud, like it creates my own kind of quiet. So in that way, it's really, it is really healing um, for me. So that meditative state of mind it also allows me to like be able to think freely <laughs> in those moments and I'm wondering too if it even just helps you process the emotions I mean you talked about a lot of really tough emotions that is shown through these pieces so even though you know you're you're seeking that quiet in the practice and that repetition like I wonder if that helps you even just like think through how you're feeling in the, in that time. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as, as I mentioned, I spent hours and hours and hours just at my sewing machine. Um, <laughs> so I'm yes, always processing. I'm like always my own therapist in my own head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Through> yeah. that. <laughs> That's something I'm a little tidbit for, for me as an artist too. And you know, cause for those of you that don't know, Liz was actually my professor in undergrad, but I tend to often not work from a place of um, like concept. Um, I have done it a couple times, but I think that it's really interesting and me stretching my own wings in that way a little bit and trying it and realizing like, if you really give your heart to working on an art project that has a concept to it and you spend your time making it, thinking about that concept, like there's so much power in that process. And I think it shows in your pieces in the final product. Um, I'm not a mother myself, but for those that joined us, even at the opening, hearing other women talk about how they looked at a piece and they knew what they saw <clears throat> or other visitors who have just come to the gallery over the month while it's up and then they come down and they're like, oh my gosh, that piece was incredible I knew exactly what it was as soon as I walked in there and like she portrayed that so well so I think it's amazing to see that shine through in your final final pieces thank you I appreciate that and you've got well, a I... couple other compliments here oh, um, in the chat just such a beautiful and compelling representation of motherhood in the process of becoming a mother Jacqueline says they're blown away 
Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> and Barbara said, thank you for your honesty and that you bring into your work and life. Um, and I second that. That was a very compelling lecture. Thank you. Well, again, I appreciate everybody's time, um, you know, and efforts spent. I know it's hard to log into all of these things, but I appreciate you joining me this evening and allowing me to share, um, you know, those intimate moments. Thank yeah, you. And thank you so much for sharing, sharing that intimacy and that personal connection that you have with your pieces. Um, it looks like we don't have any other questions. So I think unless anybody wants to sneak one in here well, there we go we got one more <laughs> I have more <laughs> wonderful um awesome. how are you processing school age um he's wondering what the work will look like when you have teenagers will there be more pins and sharp things <laughs> Well, right now I'm trying to, um, you know, uh, grapple with the fact that I've just climbed on all day, every day. Um, you know, uh, so Ellie, I meant to add a photo of my kids. Uh, I have one a really adorable photo of Ellie standing next to one of my pieces from the show. Um, but anyway, uh, she's six and Nikki's going to be three in June. So almost three. Um, but yeah, I mean, that transition, it's its happening really quickly coming out of like toddlerhood and into young kid. So I'm not sure. I mean, I have several other collections that I work on uh, consistently through this. So you, as I mentioned, this is like a seven, this has been a seven year process that I've been working on these pieces. Um, so I'm not, I don't know. I don't know what the future will hold. I, I can only, you know, Ellie's definitely got part of my personality in her. <laughs> the sass is real <laughs> so who knows <laughs> she's gonna want to influence more too she in the at the opening she kept saying how she helped pick this material or that material and this piece was designed after me <laughs> <laughs> she's definitely a budding artist mm -hmm. I will say for sure absolutely <laughs> All righty then. I think that that covers all of them. I don't know if that more meant there's there's more than one coming, but I think that that might be everything. Um, so yes, thank you again for doing this for us and for showing your work at the gallery. It's been a wonderful time. Um, and I look forward to seeing all your future work. Thank you. And I just want to thank Peters Valley again. It's been really helpful to you know my students and myself so um really thank you for the support of course mm -hmm. all righty guys have such a wonderful night the rest of your night everybody and we will see you around campus and online thank you bye thank you so much for tuning in we would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible if you liked this video please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future